Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'm really excited to be leading this talk for this wonderful conference full of wonderful people and wonderful things. Um, so my name is Jasmine Morris, I work at the CCI and I work at Central St Martins as well. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit though and today I'm going to be talking about how we can rewrite narratives through codes in the context of empowerment, education, activism and outreach and I've definitely put an accidental S on the end of outreach but I'm going to continue anyway. So first I'm going to speak about my practice. I've kind of broken this talk down into three sections. Um, and I'm speaking about my practice because I do think it's quite relevant. However, the talk is less about me and more about society and movements. But um, I am going to speak about myself a little bit and my career. And then at the end, I'll tie it all together and everything will make sense. And I'll kind of, yeah, talk about the, the main kind of the most important thing, which is other people, really, and communities. Um, so my practice... I am a creative computing artist and educator, so I make art with creative computing and I use that umbrella term because I use a lot of different software and tools and approaches to make work. Um, I was trying something new and I work in creative computing education, both at the CCI and at Central St Martins and outside of that as well, which is also really important to me. I don't really like um, any of the super academic terms and I hate the word teacher. Um, so I've kind of settled for educator because I, I guess like that kind of to me means that I spread information to people. Um, so I look at representation and inclusivity within technology, predominantly using virtual reality and open source game development tools to create experiences that highlight issues surrounding gender, race and power. Um, so often I'm looking at the roles of gender and queerness and how that can be reimagined through technology, how we can empower people through technology. Um, race, of course, I do a lot of work about being a mixed race person and um, for my brown like brothers and sisters, I try to make work for us to empower us. Um, and power, I also focus on systems of power within the technology industry um, and the connotations of that. And um, I guess the power in distributing knowledge as well, which links back to my kind of role in education. Um, I'm focused on the complexities of simulating culture and identity that comes through in cosplay, particularly. Um, and yes, I play role-playing games and participate in cosplay and for me that is about extending my Caribbean identity through characters and narratives and again especially in these kind of niche areas we really don't see enough representation so it's really important for me to put myself out there and be loud about it in these kind of nerdy societies that, that I kind of yeah socialize within. So this is some pictures of me doing cosplay. Um, so this is part of my practice, but it's also fun. Um, so on the left, you can see I'm cosplaying Lara Croft. This was part of a larger piece that looked at the role of military in technology and also the representation of the female body and um, especially the, the sexualization of Angelina Jolie as Lara Croft. So it's very interesting for me to cosplay, um, to kind of walk in Angelina Jolie's footsteps, what that meant as like a large black woman, um, you know, kind of cosplaying Lara Croft. And then on the right, um, I'm cosplaying Sonic here. This one was a little bit of fun. Sonic is iconic, um, pardon the pun, but this one for me, it was about the wig and the lipstick because like this electric blue colour is so popular like in Caribbean culture, like you see a lot of aunties wearing this electric blue lipstick and this this like electric blue colour and I was like, wait a minute, I can seriously do something with Sonic here and this colour that I'm so used to seeing like older family members wear and just like 
women around. Um, so yeah, this piece was a bit of fun. And when I do cosplay, I'm not necessarily trying to completely repl replicate the character because I think that it's too, it's already been done. I guess the character's already been created, in my opinion, without people like me in mind. So it's not really interesting for me to try and be Sonic or try and be Lara Croft or whoever I'm cosplaying. It's about accepting myself and you know embracing my identity and reliving it through a character so i guess my cosplay is more inspired by famous characters rather than yeah trying to replicate them anyway um this is a snapshot of a piece i made um called a collection of obj's and um, this was a virtual reality piece it was a 360 experience and this was the VR piece that coincided with the Lara Croft cosplay so this was a wider research project that really looked at um, bodies against machinery and guns desensitization that comes along with gaming um, so I guess like the placement of these objects um, next to one another stripping away the materials and the texture it was really to kind of highlight how they're all kind of these digital objects that we kind of have the power as a player to manipulate and use um, and yeah become potentially quite desensitized to quite heavy topics um, so yeah that was um, a collection of, of objects and this is a snippet from a game that I've recently made actually this is my most recent work it's so uh, Difficult to find the time to make work at the moment, but I did pull this together um, a few weeks ago now. So this game is called Fifty Shades of Brown. And um, as I said, this is a kind of snippet from the game. I've made it into a GIF, which is hilarious. Um, and I've got a, a slide about it, actually. So Fifty Shades of Brown is an exploration of digital skin tone and what representation in online spaces could look like. The buttons in the game are each a hex code for a different shade of brown, a simulation of brown skin. The categorization of color and reference to the erotic drama Fifty Shades of Grey explores the problematic fetishization of people of color, both within and outside of the sex industry. This game was made to highlight the lack of representation of people of colour in online space and to celebrate people of colour and the differences between us. What does it feel like to see something so political in society reduced to its raw digital pigment? So that's my kind of explanation of what this piece means to me and, and what I'm trying to highlight there. Um, and, you know, pieces like this really come from my early practice, which... I guess my whole practice was kind of inspired by my love for kind of like simulation games. But, um, you know, until recent years, like it's been really difficult to recreate characters that I identify with, whether that's due to a lack of skin tone variation, hair, even like jewellery, clothes that I identify with. Um, and I feel like, um, yeah, I guess it, that's cool for some games, but like when it's meant to be replicating life and I've always just felt a bit like I can't fit in and like I can't make myself um so I've always thought about yeah I guess this was a very physical way of exploring this idea of well yeah 50 shades of brown it was kind of me just saying look like if I can do this if I can pull 50 shades of brown from from like a color chart why can't the game industry do a little bit better um and of course I'm referencing other things as well um Anyway, the game industry is doing a little bit better and that's really nice to see, but um, I guess I'm still heavily inspired by, by my experience and kind of, yeah, like growing up without any of that stuff. Um, so now I'm going to move on and speak about my career. So I guess you've got a bit of an idea of who I am as an artist. As I said, I definitely don't get enough time to make work. Um, so yeah, that's something I'm going to work on 2021, hey-ho, if anything happens. Um, but yeah, I'm going to speak about my career now. And um, for a while, I saw them as separate things. I saw my practice and my career as separate entities. But I'm very blessed because I think in the last couple of years, I've, I've started to see that actually my career is just an extension of my practice and as I was kind of touching on at the beginning it's really important for me to 
share knowledge with people and um I guess that's my main thing like I just think that it's a really empowering thing to do and when I'm criticizing I guess like design and technology um for their poor design and poor consideration of diverse people and whether that's brown people, queer people, people with neurological differences, whatever it may be. For me, the most empowering thing that I can do is educate the next generation of designers and try to make sure we don't make the same mistakes. Um, anyway, my career. So this is a really early thing that I did and this is kind of, it was really nice looking back on this actually. This was one of the first bits of teaching that I did. I was in my second year of university and I taught university and master students um, immersive technology, virtual reality, um, AR and yeah, general immersive technology with a group of wonderful people from the Digital Maker Collective. Shout out to the Digital Maker Collective, by the way, um, and Chris Follows, the founder of that. But yeah, we found ourselves, yeah, running this module immersive, which is great, which was great. Um, and yeah, we were in Somerset House for a week um, or two weeks. I'm still in touch with some of the people there as well. It was actually a fantastic um, thing, entity. And yeah, we facilitated some wonderful virtual reality pieces. And I guess from there, I was like, okay, like, wow, I'm, I'm teaching tech. Like, this is cool. Um, let's see where this is going to go. Um, this is like another career highlight of mine. This is this is way more recent. Um, well, time flies. I think this is 2019, the summer of 2019. Um, this this is the wonderful Hyphen Labs ladies and team Tate Exchange. If you don't know about Tate Exchange, it lives on the fifth floor of Tate Modern, which isn't open at the moment, but maybe one day it will be again. Um, but yeah, this was a great, um, a fantastic thing that we did. If you want to look it up, you can look up Hyphen Labs um, at Tate Exchange Higher Powers. So this was a huge week, two week long um, intervention and we ran workshops and talks and we had so many famous people there. We had Caroline Sinders, we had the dude from The Great Hack, Memo Acton, like loads of like creative technologists just here, like making things happen, having important conversations with the general public and it's important for me to speak about the general public because um doing things like this and working with the, the general public like whatever that means I guess the people that go into galleries um but still it's it's something um it made me realize that I, again I really enjoyed sharing knowledge and I really enjoyed speaking with people and kind of yeah like empowering them and, and getting them involved in conversations that they're often excluded from um, this was a great thing. This was um, a workshop that I did in collaboration with the Institute of Coding and Sisterhood. This was working with young women and people that identify as female or non-binary. And again, just doing creative techie stuff. Um, it was always a dream for me to work with the Institute of Coding, so I'm really glad I got to in the end. This was, again, more recent. Um, I guess this is a good example of things that I do outside of work, things that I get asked to do and things that I ensure that I'm involved in because as much as working in higher education is important to me and it's great, it's also important for me to be involved in other things because education, higher education only has so much reach and it almost like doesn't fill my cup of like need. Um, so I make sure I'm involved in loads of other things as well and this is a good example of some of the cool things I have the privilege of being involved in. Um, STEMETs, shout out to STEMETs, they're a charity that work with, again, young women and people that identify as female or non-binary. To get them into the STEM industry, they've got a society that is hundreds of young people deep and they do amazing things, events, panels, talks, school trips. Um, Anne-Marie Maffedon is the founder, she's a very famous mathematician and an inspiration of mine and I got to work at STEMETS and I can't believe that I've left already, I was there for a year and then I guess my career moved really fast and I couldn't fit it in anymore but I'm still an ambassador for them and um, again it was great career development for me, like I guess making lots of connections in the tech industry and working with young people and again empowering young people and to be honest, I'm really excited about the next generation of designers and technologists and scientists and engineers that we've got coming because there is an absolute storm coming and I always say that. I said that after the Institute of Coding workshop as well. There is a, a serious storm coming. Um, 
And yeah, I run Tech Yard for the Creative Computing Institute. This is a great screenshot of me mid mid workshop. So that is an ongoing thing. And at the moment, you know, that is the thing that I'm feeling very passionate about. And I'm really grateful that the CCI support me to run this initi initiative and it's growing and it's doing amazing things. So we run um, weekly workshops um, with young people. We're working with 11 to 14 year olds at the moment from South East London. And I get guests in to run things. I run things myself. It's great. But again, the young people are amazing. I love working with them. And yeah, it's just really important for me to ensure that I'm doing this groundwork, this outreach work. Um, Georgina supports me, but I pretty much sit and send emails out and just try and get people involved and speak to some amazing people and plan this amazing programme. And I just feel so privileged that I'm able to do that. And it really is my dream to work with, like, not necessarily young people, but just anyone that wouldn't usually have access to this very elite industry. And it's important for me to be who I am and, and to lead these sessions in, in, in the way that I lead them and make people feel as included and listened to as possible. So Tech Yard is amazing and I'm really excited to see where it goes. And thank you so much to the CCI for, you know, supporting me through that. Um, and then, yeah, I didn't want to put pictures about it all and I didn't want to talk about it all for too long. Um, wow, I'm actually doing okay for time though. That's good. Um, but I've also done loads of other things and to be honest seeing it all like this I guess no wonder I'm a little bit burnt out and um, a little bit tired sometimes I guess I've done quite a lot and my career has really snowballed and I'm not saying this to um, big myself up but I guess it's become important for me to appreciate what I've achieved um, because of the next section that I'm going to come on to it will all make sense when I wrap this talk up in the third part um, but yeah each and every experience that I've done each and every career step has been meaningful and I've been involved in so many things with so many wonderful organizations and the connections that I've made keep on connecting there's this like spider web of amazing talent and amazing people that like is just forever growing um, and yeah, I guess, um, yeah, shout out to Projects by If, um, a technology studio that focus on data privacy. They work with brands to ensure that they're following guidelines and they advise people on how to, they're, they're, a, they're a great studio because they're actually doing something that not enough people are doing. We're not, not enough people are talking about the whole, the whole data thing that is happening in the background of everything. Um, so yeah, I've, have, I've had the privilege of working with them and that really made me realize how important it is when I'm teaching design to also teach privacy otherwise the same mistakes are going to be made over and over again it's too easy to make the mistakes um I've worked with building imagination that's a school club that works with like lego and robotics and um, so back when schools existed I used to run um an after school club with them which was great again working with young children they were actually children they were actually kids I'm not going to call them young people because they were like five they were so cute um, and so intelligent and also I got to play with Lego so that was great um, ran a summer program for University of the Arts London this summer just gone actually which was great again I got to connect with loads of young people um, based in the CCW campuses so that was Camberwell Chelsea and Wimbledon not quite sure if I hit Chelsea to be honest but we definitely got some young people from Campbell and some young people from Wimbledon involved and that was just like arts and crafts and obviously a little bit of it was techy because I can't help that but had to pull some of my my artist friends in that do actual like um I guess like can make things out of recycling and stuff because that's not really my forte um, but yeah, summer programme for them was great. Working with organisations like Two to Three Degrees, a fantastic organisation that works with young people. I've done tech workshops with them, with Julia, um, my creative technology bestie, um, Neon Digital Arts Festival, which is in Dundee. That was in a shopping centre. And I got to, um, yeah, lead a gaming workshop with, again, the general public, trustee for Trajectory Theatre. I feel like I'm going on a little bit now, but you get the gist. Um, and yeah, we're at, we're at present times and I lecture at the Creative 
Computing Institute um, in the Creative Practice Unit and I'm the lead digital tutor at Central St Martins and obviously as I said I run Tech Yard and I do whatever else I can squeeze into the week as well. Now I have spoke about all of that for a reason and I'm going to tie it all together. This wasn't a space for me to just talk about myself for half an hour but I do think it was relevant because I'm now going to speak about my story and why I've done what I've done and why I've built this spider web, I'm going to call it, this network, um, and what, what the future might look like for that as well. So I grew up on a council estate in West Yorkshire, if you can't already tell, I'm from Yorkshire, and I grew up in extreme poverty. My mum was on benefits, like everyone on the street was on benefits. It was like you know, I'm not going to, like, polish it. It was a rough estate. I mean, there were some amazing people that happened there and the community was amazing and I don't want to paint it in a negative light, but there was also a lot of crime and a lot of hardship and just a lot of general poverty in the area and it was difficult growing up. Of course, I had limited access to technology and I guess that's something that's always stuck with me and, you know, as, as a gamer now, it's interesting because... I think there were so many barriers um, for me to access the gaming industry and that's why it's so important for me to participate, whether it's gaming, cosplay, making work about gaming, criticising the gaming industry, whatever it is. I think that's why it's so prevalent in my practice because for so many reasons I couldn't access gaming. It was too expensive for a start, but even if I did manage to get my hands on the console or whatever then you know what I spoke about in my practice there was the, the racial boundaries the the identity boundaries the kind of logical boundaries um I was going to call this talk I used to be scared of code and then we decided it wasn't the right title but I did used to be really scared of code and technology because I didn't even get a laptop until I was like 13 or something um, so it doesn't come natural to me and that's why I'm giving this backstory because I've ranted on about my successful career in creative technology for long enough now and I think that it's really important for me to be transparent and yes code is scary and we need to remember that when we're teaching it um, and it's not accessible to everyone but I've proven to myself that you know for someone that didn't naturally take to tech I've built a successful career in it, so someone at some point, including myself, must have done something right. Um, but yeah, I was resistant to education, I was one of those naughty kids, getting excluded all the time, um, I don't know how I made it through school, but then I did kind of um, knuckle down in college, and I guess that's how I made it to uni. Um, and I felt like a statistic a lot of the time, I felt like my path was already written for me and I'd kind of accepted it um and that's what everyone around me was doing and um yeah I guess like you hear yourself being spoken about on the tv like and that's why I'm very funny about terms and you know terms like hard to reach and you know it's postcode areas and catchment areas, whatever because like it you know as as someone that experienced it you do just end up feeling like a statistic and you can you can kind of tell when they're like targeting you and it's like you know you're somewhat resistant to it because you feel a bit like you've been like picked anyway um yeah so I guess that was my experience and I'm gonna close the talk with some powerful statements that hopefully tie this talk together and, and help make sense of everything that I've said. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm going to close with my learnings and the learnings that I'd like to pass on to this audience, whether you are an academic or a young person yourself or um, a creative technologist or a designer or an artist or whatever you are, I guess I'd like to leave with these messages and hopefully that's going to tie up the segments of the talk because now I've done it, I'm worried this was all a little bit random. Um, but yeah, firstly, the value in the education system and UAL have not paid me to say this, but if it wasn't for the education system, I would have been completely lost. I followed it, as, as I said, I scraped through high school and then I got to college and I was kind of like, 
okay, maybe I can do something. And then I got to my foundation and then I really found a passion for art. And I guess I grew up a little bit, so I wasn't as much of a little, um, you know. Um, and then I went to uni and then all of a sudden, as I said, by my second year, I was teaching at Somerset House. And you can imagine how ironic, like how ironic's not the word, obscene that was for me. It, it really was. It, a lot of experiences in my second and third year, I always tell this story and I think it really sums up what I was going through. But I was going to these like networking events, um, like these tech ones, like at places like Digital Catapult in um, Central and like Here East, like places like that. And um, they're the kind of places where like when you go in, you leave your coat and bags like on a coat hanger outside and then you go in. And I'd honestly never been anywhere like that before. And I was like, so like funny about leaving my stuff because like where I come from, like if you leave a coat and a bag, like, you know, it's quite obvious what's going to happen to it. And like just little things like that, like learning the language of like, I guess, like a higher class in society and that was another like boundary that I had to come through and and I guess now I'm more confident and I've learned to just be myself but like at the time I was you know I, I wasn't an imposter it wasn't imposter syndrome I, I guess I was an imposter and I was just trying to do a thing <laughs> and I guess it worked um but yeah anyway the value in the education system I still believe in it because I believe it's a big part in what helped me but that is not to say that it's not flawed and not to say that it's not our responsibility as academics to work from within it to help and change it because institutions take too long to change. So it's a big statement, but I would argue that your role as an educator is to do the groundwork because we can't wait for the institutions to change and there's too many problems going on now. But please believe in it and don't lose faith in it because I guess it can change lives. Um, representation matters and that's why I've remained authentic. Um, representation matters because if I would have had someone that looked like me that, that worked in tech or, or art or anything that I was interested in, maybe I would have been a little bit less reluctant to do, to do it, um, to learn, to engage in things. And I know that, I just know that I don't want any young person to have to go through that again and I can't change the world but I know that rather than turning into something that I could have turned into like rather than becoming everyone that I was seeing at those networking events at here east I just kind of remained authentic to myself and that's why it's really important for me to have my acrylics and and wear my jewelry and like wear what I want and like let my body be because there's not enough people that I guess look like me and, and talk like me and, and do things like me and I think it's important to make space for us um, and yeah to empower other people that feel the same to know that it doesn't matter like what your aesthetic is or how you speak or how you're going about something as long as you've got something interesting to say like you know all voices should be heard so for me it's been really important to remain authentic to myself and I think Again, everyone should understand that that's why representation matters because people need to see people that they can relate to to properly engage, I think. Um, I'm a big believer in open source and sharing knowledge or knowledge exchange. Um, open source technology, you know, means that people can learn things that technically, you know, you can get paid a lot of money for from their bedroom and all they need is access to Wi-Fi and and, a, and I guess like even a smartphone. Um, and I'm not saying that everyone's got access to that because they haven't. And, you know, especially with the pandemic, it scared me a bit because a lot of things have moved online and we need to understand that not everybody is digitally literate. Um, however, I'm still, you know, a big advocate for making things as open source as possible and sharing knowledge. The only way we're going to regain power is is through sharing knowledge and empowering people that wouldn't usually have access to that knowledge. Um, so yeah, there are a few coders out there that really also believe in this and it's really warming to see that. I guess like the whole p5.js community really stand for this and you know, I'm sure there's loads of other examples as well. But for me, I will distribute knowledge to anyone that I can because 
for me, that's a way of kind of, yeah, regaining power from, I guess, when we're speaking about big things like the technology industry um, and large institutions, it's, it's one of the ways to kind of, again, like come back down to the groundwork and work with like real people. Um, so remember that the creative and the technology industry is very exclusive and when they're mushed together, it's terrifying because the tech industry is already very exclusive and so is like art and its history and its origins. Like I studied fine art and I know how exclusive it is. So when they're mushed together, it's terrifying. But from my experience, when creative and computing um, do go together, something interesting happens and somehow there is space for people like me and I guess Maybe that's how I've kind of got to where I am and I'm able to do what I'm doing and why I know so many other amazing people in the creative computing industry that are kind of singing the same song um, or maybe with slightly different lyrics, but also really important. Some of them are also on this like lineup, so I hope you've listened to their talks as well. But um, as exclusive as it is, something exciting happens in my opinion and yeah, I guess space is made for voices and we can use technology as a construct to re-identify ourselves or to explore our identity and empower other people to explore theirs. And I think this is the last one. It's going to be annoying if it isn't, um, because I've said that now, but I'm going to treat it like it's the last one and then if it's not, then I'll treat the actual last one like it's the last one. But yeah, empower people to design a better future. And I guess that speaks for itself. It's what I think that I'm doing. And um, it's what I think, again, everyone should be doing. If you're an artist, an educator, whatever you are, share the knowledge that you have, exchange the knowledge that you have, and empower people, not just young people, but everybody, a diverse range of people, to design a better future. Because we need a little bit of hope, especially in this climate. Nope, it wasn't the last one. I knew it wouldn't be. Okay, so yeah, I'll quickly speak about this Trojan horse theory that I have. Um, and I guess, yeah, this summarises everything. So I've been describing myself as a Trojan horse for a long time. And as I've explained, I don't necessarily um, relate to the institutions that I work for um, and some of the kind of, yeah, companies that I've, I've been involved with and, and the culture there. Not to say it's a bad one, but it's just not relatable for me. I've, I've got my safe spaces. I've got my friends. I've got my communities and they don't necessarily, apart from the CCI, they don't necessarily exist like in these large institutions, but I Trojan horsed it and I went into academia and education for a reason and it's because I believe that like through, um, through being inside something that has so much potential for positive change... I can do the groundwork and help to make that positive change happen. And I know that there are loads of other people doing the same. So be a Trojan horse and get yourself into somewhere and change it from within. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that was okay um, and not too random. Yeah, thank you for listening. That was me talking about narratives and code and empowerment and education and activism and outreach and hopefully it all makes sense now and um yeah have a great day